So for the next three weeks, and first of all, I must say I'm so excited, we'll be talking about discipleship. Turn to somebody and say, I love discipleship. <laughs> so this morning, um, I, op- I want to open with uh, a very, very powerful scripture from Matthew's gospel. We call it the Great Commission. And we know that after Jesus' death and resurrection, he appeared to his disciples and, he, listen, he instructed all Christians to share the gospel with everyone and live it out everywhere in the world. Here's what it says, Matthew 28. If you've got your Bible, you can turn there. It's up on the screen, verses 18 and 19. It says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. You know, from the time the disciples who are regular people just like you and I, from the time they answered Jesus' call to follow him, there have been those who have heard the call and unfortunately didn't respond. And thank God there have been many, many, many who have taken the message to heart and they devoted their lives to following Christ. So today, Uh, I want to begin by talking about what that looks like. What is discipleship? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? You know, in some of our today churches, it can be pretty easy for them, all of us, I guess, to lose sight of what it means to actually serve as teachers of those who would follow Christ with their heart, soul, mind, and strength. We often find ourselves caught up in a battle of good intentions, but also, with that being said, sometimes our structures are ineffective and we have some misplaced priorities as well. I've been reading the book Membership to Discipleship, and in there, I thought this was really neat uh, to share with you this morning. And that book shares about a video on YouTube of Francis Chan Speaking at a conference on, ready, how not to make disciples. Here's what Pastor Chan says. He says, I don't say to my daughter, Rachel, go clean your room and then have her come back in an hour and say, Dad, I heard what you said. So I memorized it. I can say it in Greek. And later, I'm going to have a bunch of my friends over to study about what it would be like if I cleaned my room. (laughs) And in all honesty, sometimes we have this philosophy that if we could just teach people more about the Bible, more about Jesus, and more about spiritual disciplines, then everything in life would be better. And listen, i got to tell you, that I really believe that memorizing scriptures is, is, is just a wonderful thing. I also believe that studying the Bible is incredible. That's what we should do. But listen, discipleship is not just about information. It's about behaviors. It's not just about education. It's about transformation. Somebody say amen. 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 You know, I was thinking this week, maybe the best path forward would be for us as church leaders to return to some of the foundational practices of the church's history. Less about reinventing the wheel and more about remembering where we came from. Discipleship matters. Can I say that again? Discipleship matters. So Let's start this morning by answering probably the most critical question is, okay, what is a disciple? Notice I didn't ask, what is a church attender? What is a disciple? There's a vast difference between knowing God and knowing about God. It's the same thing with going to church and and yet being the church. How many of you know that this is a building? We are the church. Amen? Amen. We are the church. So I was looking through some different books, different things online, 
And in the book, Growing True Disciples, George Barna, you've heard me mention his name often, I thought that he very clearly described what makes a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Here's what a disciple looks like again. He says, disciples experience, listen, a changed future through their acceptance of Jesus Christ. They find now that the Christian faith is their defining, listen, philosophy of life. So with that being said, they undergo a transformed lifestyle that's manifested through Christ-oriented values, goals, perspectives, activities, and relationships. That is so important, I think, that I'm going to go back and repeat it again. We as Christ followers, when we accepted Christ as our Savior, now the Christian life is our defining philosophy. It's how we live. It's who we are. It's not just going to church on Sunday morning. No, it's Monday through Sunday. A transformed lifestyle manifested through Christ-oriented values, goals, perspectives, activities, and relationships. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that as Christ followers, we are a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life is has become. Isn't that wonderful? So with that being said, as we mature, our worldview begins to change. Truth becomes really a God-driven reality for us. And so pursuing God and his truth, having a personal relationship with him, knowing him, you know, that becomes our lifelong quest. Pause. I was convicted this week, you know, with what I just said and you just heard. Because I thought in my own life, I need to step it up. See, here's the thing. I think it's so important for us to understand that as we mature, we grow. We look at where we've come from and we look towards where we're going and we thank God that he's changed us. We are new people. We're different. I was looking at some research this week and according again to Barna's research, nearly half of Americans claim, listen, to be born again. If you know what that means, raise your hand. To be born again. Nearly half of Americans claim to be born again, but only about 13% of them reflect behaviors and attitudes that differ from the world around them. John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist movement, developed an intricate biblical system for creating disciples of Christ. And I'm telling you, that system is still incredibly relevant today. It's called a three-part system consisting of what he called societies, class meetings, and bands. So let's talk about that for a moment. Society meetings, they were kind of like small congregations. Anywhere from 50 to maybe several hundred members, they met on Sunday evenings, they sang, they worshiped, and then there was preaching. The second group was what he called class meetings. They met weekly usually about 12 people of mixed gender and mixed marital status. And finally, the deepest level of commitment was called a band. Come on, I know you'd say that, Jason. (laughs) And so Wesley's band was special. They typically consisted of three to four people. These were individuals who were all male or all female. And you know what they did? They came together and they talked to each other about their life. They were open. They confessed sin, knowing that there would be no fear of condemnation. They were, in essence, what we probably today would call like an accountability group. How are you doing? How's your life? And as you can imagine... 
these were the most <laughs> not attended of the three. You know, it's interesting because we sometimes find ourselves in a place where we don't want to be intimate with other people. We have our secrets, we have our ideals and our lifestyles and such, and, and we just kind of like to stay in the group. We just like to come to church or we can sit there and, you know, hi, good morning, how are you? I'm fine, how about you? So Wesley developed a very amazing, and I, and I think it's a simple plan for maturing and equipping the saints through small groups. He called it the general rules. Now, if you've been in the Methodist church for very long, you've probably heard some of these, but I, I still felt like it was important just, just to cover that. The general rules. And this is what followers of Christ are to do. Number one, do no harm by avoiding evil of every kind. Number, did I say number two first? Or did I say number one? Okay, just want to make sure. Number two, I want to make sure you're listening. I'm just kidding. Number two, he says, do good to all people. Number three, he said, then attend the ordinances of God by participating in worship, taking communion, like we did this morning, reading the Bible, and praying. So what is a disciple? It's all of that and more. A disciple is someone who is, is, is in the process of growing. It, it's a lifelong journey. We, you know, as Christ followers, we're not just learning about Jesus, but the transformation in us is making us more like him. Why is Christianity, why is being a Christ follower the best thing on this earth that anyone can do? Because it changes us. It transforms us. Wesley said this, he says, the church makes the world not by making converts, but by making disciples. The church changes us not by being converts, but by being disciples. And this still rings true today. Jesus had uh, a small group of 12. He called him his disciples. He had an intimate group uh, of three uh, with Peter, James, and John. A small group is like a micro community. It, it, it's Christ followers coming together and and loving each other, and having honesty, and growth, and doing the Christian life together. You know, we see this in the practices of some of the first believers. Acts 2.42 says, the community continually committed themselves to learn what the apostles taught them. They gathered for fellowship, breaking bread, and praying. You know, small groups you know, they make disciples by utilizing God's story and, and how it intersects with our story. We encourage each other in a small group. We celebrate life's, accomplishes, uh, life's accomplishments together in, in a small group. We observe traditions. We rejoice together. We walk together through challenges in life that can be difficult. We pray for one another. We love on each other. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. I got to say, I love small group. I love being involved in a small group. I need that. It's important. It's, it's crucial for me. It's crucial for all of us. Some of you might think, why in the world would I want to be in a small group? Listen, small groups are so, I just think they're so necessary for us. They provide a much needed opportunity for you and I to navigate the complexities of life, uh, the confusion of life, chaos, you know, it's a place where other people we meet with are in the trenches with us. And we can come and we can love each other and pray for one another. What a safe place they are 
You know, we can, we can know other people and people can know us. I, I believe that small groups are like a second family to us. Listen, this morning, we're going to show you a video in just a moment. It's a vital part, I believe, of God's design for spiritual growth. Man, I get so excited when I think about discipleship. I, I, I get so excited when I think about, you know, the opportunity that we can provide to come together in smaller groups. It is so difficult, you know, to be in large groups as opposed to the small groups where we can talk to one another and love one another and, and know each other's names and such. Watch this video. It's, it's important. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bob Matos and this is my wife, Sherry. I've been a member of Trinity for about six years. And we are part of the organizing team for Open Doors, which is a small Bible study group that meets on Wednesday nights in our members' homes. The group has been in existence for about three and a half years. We usually go over a Bible study, uh, and occasionally, every couple of months, we'll do a social, social dinner. dinner. We'll do a social dinner. We were members of Sc the Scattered Bunch group. And as it got bigger and bigger, we broke off of that group with the Prices, Jim and Marcia, and became the organizers for the Open Doors group. I was a member of the Catholic Church, and as a member of the Catholic Church, I found we very rarely read the Bible, uh, almost never. I mean, really, we just went to church once on Sunday. You didn't get to know the members of your community other than just seeing them at church once a week. Uh, and that isn't enough. You really have to. Get, get to know them, get involved uh, with them personally. And the Bible study does that. I've gotten to know a number of people personally, more than just seeing them at church once a week. Uh, and a personal relationship, uh, I think, helps uh, Christians to grow in their faith. It's, I know that it's helped me to grow in my faith as we've studied um, different scriptures and as we've shared with some of the members of our group. Um, we've let ourselves be a little bit more vulnerable. It's not just a social um, outing. We have enjoyed socials, but we also know each other pretty well and trust each other. And um, my relationship with Jesus has become deeper, more consistent um, through consistent Bible study. I think what we're trying to say is that just sitting in the services on Sunday mornings is, is fine, but that if, if you really want to grow, get involved in something, get involved in a small group of some kind. We'd strongly encourage you based on our experience. It's, um, it's really life enriching and wonderful. That was awesome. So I'm going to ask the band to come as I close. Um, here's the thing. Discipleship is, I think it's all about hospitality. It's about relationship, community, accountability. I want to, uh, it's, it's important for us to recognize how important it is for community. We all need and love community. I read this week that 60 to 80% of people who walk through the church doorstep do that because they were invited by someone that they already had an existing relationship with. Man, discipleship is all about belonging. And I believe that God has wired all of us to be in a relationship with other people. I just feel this morning like some of you I don't know how many of you are involved and maybe you've not yet taken the plunge. But discipleship is so important because it just focuses on helping us develop who God is. You know, engaging regularly with a small group I think is so important because it's, we, can, we can study, we can talk together, we can pray with each other. And it's just so powerful to help us transform into who God has called us to be. 
Listen, if you haven't joined a small group, I pray that you'll really consider doing that. Together we grow, together we learn, together we serve, and together we live life. Amen.